Hey guys, welcome to the Introvert Dating Success Show. I'm your host, Harry Wilmington. This is the show where you learn how to date as your introverted self while still getting your precious alone time. And on today's show, I've got another great interview with a dating expert. His name is Jeffrey Satiawan, and he is a guy that also helps out other men who have had fractured relationships, and he helps them figure out how to better communicate with the women in their lives and how to build emotional safety. And so actually today's show, we're gonna be talking all about how it is that emotional safety breaks down in a relationship and how you can better build it up. It's a fascinating interview. We've got a lot of great insights that you're gonna to hear today, including this one little game that he ends up playing with me, uh, virtually obviously, that actually not will, will open your eyes, because it definitely opened mine to the biases that we have in our heads that we may not even be aware of that ends up hurting us when we're trying to reconnect with our partners. So we got a lot of fascinating stuff in the show you're about to hear. Be sure to take a listen to it and be sure to check out Jeffrey's website as well as his YouTube page, all the info which you'll hear inside this show. So let's go ahead and take a listen. All right, guys, welcome back to the Introvert Dating Success Show. I'm your host as always, Harry Wilmington. And today... I am interviewing Jeffrey. He is a relationship coach who helps empower men to rebuild their relationships and marriages from the ground up. Uh, between his YouTube channel and his website, relationshipsmaster.com, Jeffrey coaches men who are struggling in their relationships and helps them find permanent and life-changing results. I've seen quite a few of his videos on YouTube and in other places, and this man definitely knows what he's talking about, and I'm happy to have him on the show. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thanks, Harry. Good to be here as well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. Like I said, I'm glad I was able to reach out to you. I like talking to fellow uh, relationship coaches about about all aspects of relationships and getting into them and then trying to make them uh, be sustainable and last. Uh, but I always start out with every, the, with all my guests with the question of uh, what was your dating life like growing up? What was your, what was your dating slash relationship journey leading up to where you're at now? Yeah. So I would say before I was uh, 19, it was non-existent dating life because, uh, you know, I grew up in a very traditional home. So my parents like never slept in the same bedroom. Uh, we never had dinners as kids, you know, uh, as a family. And they were always fighting all the time. So this interpersonal skills was non-existent when I was growing up. And I've always struggled with social anxiety, with making connections with people for the better part of the first 20 years of my life, I would say. Uh, then 19 was when I met my first um, I guess, girlfriend at that time. And I came to it in a very selfish place, uh, just like how my parents were kind of approaching it as well. Uh, very internally needy, uh, not very emotionally centered. Like at first I was too feminine and too beta in a way. And then, then I got, then I learned all these like macho techniques and became a bit too macho. So one extreme to the other. Yeah, I just wreaked so much havoc and, and I believe in this like fate or character model that I call. So I really believe like people are either meant to be or not meant to be. And that got me to see the world in a very messed up way and the relationship in a very messed up way. And I think I drove everyone I was with a bit crazy there. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it was bad to begin with. So uh, just going back a bit. So when you say you were uh, acting more feminine, what, what do you mean by that? Like what things were you doing or saying? Well, I, it's hard to, I think it's a general vibe that I was giving because I was struggling with relationships for so long that when I actually had the relationship that I wanted, I held so much importance to it. I put everyone on a pedestal, right? And the neediness sometimes comes up in a form of, in a very strong form of anger of, uh, you know, talking back, trying to control someone. But of course it's bred out of that insecurity inside, uh, and it's just manifests itself in so many different ways. I mean, I can, I can go the whole day just d describing all the things that I did, but I'm sure many of your listeners will know, you know? Oh yeah. No, I, my, my dad died when I was nine. So I grew up mostly around like my mom, my aunts, my grandma. My, so I very much had that same thing in terms of some of my mannerisms, kind of the way that I talked at times was definitely not, it was definitely not ex uh, exuding any masculinity towards women. So that's why I was like, I can relate yeah. to that on a level because I, I know what some of those <laughs> yeah. things would have possibly been. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Then they went to the other side where you just acted like you didn't give a shit in a way. Like you don't care about anything. Like I'm too good for you. And of course, that's bred out of that pseudo self-esteem as well, where you're just telling yourself you're awesome. You're a high value man, but you don't really know what it means, what 
it looks like really. Yeah. So it's just toxic both sides. Hmm. Were you getting like uh, intel or information about how to be a man from uh, I would say not so positive places or like how did you come up? How are you initially trying to figure out, okay, what does a man do? And then what did you find when you were doing those things that you liked or didn't like? Yeah. I went to the normal streams like, you know, coach Corey Wayne, subtle art of not giving an F, right? It's like all those things basically tell you like a man can walk away and mean it and doesn't need anyone, uh, sources his strengths from within, which is great. But I think that can get you to the other extreme where you seem a bit too aloof on the passive side of things. And also on the active side of things, when you don't get actually, when, when you playing aloof doesn't get you what you want. And because you're creating, you're operating from this insecurity still, you go to the other direction where now you get insecure and controlling again. Yeah, that can be a lot. So then at what point did you start to feel more confident about women and have the kind of success that you wanted to have? Um, I would say I've always had, so since that first relationship and since that um, learning about like dating techniques and so on, I was pretty, I had no problems finding people to date, but getting people to have actually have a long-term relationship with me and have that be happy. That's that was a struggle for a long time, and I think uh, it wasn't until about s- now seven years ago when I met uh, my existing partner right now, and we've been together for seven years that I finally admitted to myself of my role or like my hundred percent contribution in the fifty percent. <laughs> and I started to look at um, books, went to therapy quite a lot. I went to um, coaching programs. And I bought, a, I spent a lot of money on, on those things. I, I probably spent close to 25 grand a total on all those things, but nothing was really giving me the success that we wanted. And so what we found was that, and we can get d- deeper into this was, yeah. you know, people either are focused on the tactics, the short-term tactics that makes you appear something, but you don't become that. Um, and so whenever you appear like that, you know, your partner can smell that from a mile away. And so I was saying the right things. I was doing the right things, but I don't think my partner really felt any of the things I was saying or doing. And I would always go back on my word because I didn't really mean what I said. I just said it because I knew I had to say it. I was supposed to say it. Um, And the other thing too, was that a lot of people were teaching principles that were kind of on the extremes of everything. So for example, you, we talk about being more alpha, Right. Well, being alpha and being this macho figure and strong figure, strong masculine figure is great, but it can get you to one extreme. And what we found was that the answers never really lie in the extremes. And so that was when we took all these principles that we learned from other programs, uh, other therapists, et cetera. And we really boil it down to, okay, what are the first principles behind everything here together as a couple? And that's when we really start to understand the middle ground, the gray area of everything, finding the balance in everything. Mm. And finding principles and philosophies that actually is the root core of what was actually happening rather than fixing all this symptomatic um, hundreds of things that people talk about in relationships. Right. It's kind of like all those things are basically scripts that are putting a bandaid on the problem, but it's not actually healing the wound. You said it much better. Yeah, like, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I said because I'm like, I was, I'm tr- I was trying to think in like, so you, you paid all this money and went through all this stuff and learned all these things. So at that point, do you didn't have to like, you're, you have to go back through and say, okay, of these things that I've learned, what's like the bottom, the, the, the mainline principles, each of these are, are really trying to put out there. And then how can we then make that work best for us? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so you've been with your partner for seven years now. Uh, what was, well, obviously if you've gone through all this stuff, what, what were, what were some of the issues you guys are running into that weren't allowing you to really connect the way you wanted to, or where, if it was like close to not working out? The one thing we had was, um, the initial spark, we had that. Right. And the second thing we had was at some point after a year in, we had the history, we had that, the history together that made it difficult for us to let go of each other. Right, that was the only thing we had. But in terms of eventually, communication broke down, um, respect, a- admiration broke down. Uh, we started to kind of grow apart eventually, where we weren't really aligned on a lot of different parts of life. Sure, the small things here and there of what to eat and so on, we, want, we were aligned. But on the bigger things in life that actually mattered, we had struggle aligning. And when we had struggle aligning that, that caused even more conflicts. Then on top of these conflicts, then 
eventually the the passion, the attraction, the spark kind of goes away as well because it could drown in so many problems. Yeah, so we really didn't have much. And at some point, the only thing we had was just, we had history and let's try to figure this out because we have a lot to lose now. Okay. Now, when that kind of thing happens, obviously when it, when other men get into a situation with the, with the person they're trying to date long-term, they're mm. trying to diagnose it and figure out what is the thing that's happening. So what are some of the things that guys will look at and say like, oh, these are the problems, but it's like, it's it's not really the issue, but it's things that they're looking at think could be the issue. The couple of things that people would always talk about are one is the masculine feminine polarity, right? When it comes to attraction, people talk about that a lot. lot. Yeah. People talk about uh, communication a lot, uh, communication being an issue. But the way they approach this is that you just need to communicate as if communication is a choice that you do. Um, people talk about setting boundaries uh, so that setting some ground rules so that we clear up the expectations from the both of you. And I mean, if you look at the, the main causes of breakups and the demise of the relationship is always communication issues. You have some big issues like money that you can't uh, uh, talk about. You have goal alignment issues. You have attraction issues. Those are the main, main reasons that people usually talk about, right? Yes. Um, can you think of anything else besides the ones I mentioned? Uh, let's see, losing attraction, uh, possibly not having the same uh, sexual energy in terms of how often somebody wants to do it versus somebody else. Right, or right. Practice of that. Uh, family sometimes, if they've really got to know family, it's like, oh, your mom doesn't like me or whatever. Like, very yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and we had a lot of those problems as well, but we realized was that, and and I think when you watch my videos, you will see this quite quickly, is that the root core behind everything here is really that lack of emotional safety. And just to give you a few examples of what I mean here. So let's say communication issues. You're having some communication issues. And if you go to a lot of therapists, you go to a lot of professionals, they will just tell you, hey, you guys just got to communicate better. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you want to put it into a journal and then to give the journal to someone else. You want to force communication through therapy force the communication to happen. But the problem with communication is not that we don't want to communicate, is that we often can't, right? So I'm sure in, so, so people look at stonewalling, for example. Stonewalling is a big, big no-no in relationships. Yes. And people always think about that as, oh, this is a narcissistic problem. This is a character problem. If you are in a relationship with a stonewaller, then you should get out because that's oh. a relationship that's doomed to fail forever. Just, right. just for our audience at home, w- w- uh, yeah. what is your definition of stonewalling? Stonewalling is uh, basically when, so let's say when you have a problem, a conversation that needs to happen in a relationship, but you choose to not have it. So when your partner gives you the silent treatment, the cold shoulder saying to you, I don't want to talk about it. When you know the problem needs to be talked about, a topic needs to be talked about. And so this is basically them walking away from the conversation or stonewalling, which is her putting up a wall between you mm. and her. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So people would think of this as a toxic thing to do, but what a lot of people don't realize too, is that me, you, and I'm sure everyone watching this, we have stonewalled many times in our life before, right? (laughs) Um, something bad happens. Someone asks us, Hey, what's wrong? And we say, I don't want to talk about it. Whatever you want to call it. That's, that is stonewalling. And it's not because we are jerks. There's something wrong with us. It's usually because maybe one reason is the person you're talking to, you know, will not understand what you're trying to say. Mm. Maybe you know they can't relate. Maybe you know they'll twist it into something bad. Maybe you know they'll panic and take it badly. So you just say, I don't want to get into that. Let me just keep it to myself. Right. Or maybe it's a... Because yeah. a, a lot of it actually is like, it's not that you're trying to be narcissistic. It's like you're actually the opposite. It's like, you don't want know what the other person's reaction is going to be, but whatever it's going to be, you don't want to experience that and you don't want them to experience that. So it's like, if I keep yeah. it to myself, I, I ain't got to worry about what they're going to do. Yeah. So AKA here, I'm refusing to communicate and communication breaks down because I fundamentally do not feel safe expressing what I want to express. So if, so if you look at even communication issues here, there's something deeper underlying communication Uh, communication issues, which is the lack of safety, the lack of trust. Um, You look at money issues or you look at the issue that you mentioned of um, people having different, different sexual energies and so on, right? All those stuff are just differences in relationships. And, you know, when two people come together, there's going to be differences. Now the differences only become threats when there is no safety, when there is no, basically the pipe that allows you to communicate your difference and understand each other's differences and actually 
embrace the differences and understand the differences and actually accept the differences, find a win-win, et cetera. Um, that's when it becomes threats. But for us, for example, you know, my partner and I could be, could not be more different. I'm very introverted. She's very extroverted. She likes to, the, the, the hobby she has, the thing she's interested in is very different from me. Right? But the, the key difference is that we have the safety to where we can communicate about the differences. And instead of the difference being a threat or conflicts being a threat, it now becomes massive opportunities. It's almost like, you know, if you look at a symphony, a symphony has a violinist, maybe has a cellist. If the violinist and the cellist understands how to embrace the differences and play together, it can create a better symphony. But if the violinist is always looking at the cellist and going, uh, you're different. I don't like that. The violin is more awesome. That's a big problem, right? But then again, that connection that allows the communication to happen is that safety again. So, and last example here is, you know, you talk about um, people having, going through difficult moments, uh, people having like midlife crisis, and then they say, I want some space. The real thing that is happening is that not that they want space. It's that they don't have enough safety and trust to go through that midlife crisis. Maybe they're going through some depression, some tough moments with you. So again, everything boils on the safety. If you fix the safety portion, you fix a lot of things in relationships. What are things that men do unintentionally that can cause the breakdown for a woman of emotion, having emotional safety for the guy that she's dating? Here's the thing about this. Safety is destroyed in a very subconscious way, right? So to understand this, let's look at how safety is generated uh, for a lot of our clients, for example. So let's say you're having a, uh, you're seeing a couple here that, that doesn't really have safety. So the communication breaks down, they're stonewalling each other. Whenever someone talks, they're getting really defensive really fast. And I want you to put yourself in this position where you are dealing with, a, with yourself who doesn't have safety. Your partner now is saying all the correct things. The obvious things they're doing is, sounds right. It sounds proper. But you can see while they're doing and saying the right things, you can tell inside the subtle micro expressions and micro tones they have, something is off, right? What you're going to pay attention to is not the obvious things they do, but the subtle things. And another example of this is, um, you know, people can go to YouTube video and learn how to say the right things, do the right things pretty quickly. And so they try the script. And they can do correct things sometimes pretty easily. But to, for you to do the right things all the time, that's really, really hard. So, you know, safety is created or destroyed in ways where it's really hard to fake. Right? You can't fake this internal state that allows you to create safety. And so with a lot of people, I think when they find themselves in a position where they have very little safety in a relationship and their communication is breaking down, they try to focus on the very obvious, the very tangible things like understanding what to do, what to say. They focus on the what a lot. Well, the more important thing is actually the things within, the identity shifting, the m mindset shifts, the paradigm shifts, et cetera, that allows you to say those things and say those things with the genuineness to the point where it affects your tone, your micro expressions, your micro uh, tones, et cetera, as well. And that's, I think, the part that people miss. People treat this like it's a painkiller, right? And not a lifestyle. It needs to be a lifestyle. It's very true because especially since I know women are very intuitive. And so as you're saying and doing certain things, if your body isn't matching it, your facial isn't right, your tone's not matching it, they can read that. And it actually makes them even more paranoid about what's he really thinking, what's going on. And then they don't feel that safety that they once, they once had. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. And so by extension there, a lot of the ways that people destroy safety is a very, in a very subconscious way often. So for example, a simple example of this is you are in bed together, your partner is feeling hot. So, so she says to you, hey, uh, can we turn on the AC? And maybe you, you from your very subconscious way of how you've been trained to respond, et cetera, and you go like, oh, it's fine, just, just leave it alone. Now, this action can seem very innocent to you, but that's an, a great example of how she just expressed herself and you punish that. Right. And now the problem doesn't be just become the temperature problem, but now it becomes, I can't even talk about it. So now that's another layer of problems. And the guy doesn't even understand that he's destroying safety. And the worst part about the destruction of safety is that because you destroyed safety, 
your partner will never tell you that she's feeling the lack of safety because she can't even feel safe telling you that. Mm. So a lot of men and a lot of my clients, they, they're in this position where they're destroying safety, but they have no idea they are right. until they eventually uh, have their partner say, I want a divorce. But at that point, if they watch a lot of other videos, they will say, oh, the problem is with her because they don't see their own problem. So it's a very compounding effect that never really ends. Yep. And I think the communication styles being different too is kind of a thing. Cause I noticed that, you know, women communicative wise tend to do more talking to communicate and guys tend to be more action oriented. So I think at the point where we start trying to do actions and they're like, but, but, but the problem is that you're ignoring my words. I'm, t- I'm saying stuff to you and you're not allowing <laughs> that to be heard. That makes them, that, that's the real communication issue is that they don't understand. We don't understand why it is we're doing all these things, but we're, when they say, Hey honey, I have this X, Y, and Z idea. Oh, I, that's crazy. I already got something else. It's like, she doesn't feel heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Go ahead. So how does, how does the emotional, how does the breakdown of emotional safety then affect other aspects of the relationship? Because we just think, okay, if I can just build up emotional safety again, or I can do this thing and she's going to trust me that we can go back to doing the way things were. But how does that also affect other various areas of your relationship? I mean, it's because emotional safety is really the basis for even attraction. Right. Um, like it, it literally destroys every single thing in the relationship if you don't have that safety. For example, um, in the current relationship world, they always talk about how there needs to be that masculine feminine polarity. That's the secret behind attraction. If you want to keep that attraction alive, that you, you need to animate that masculine side of things. Um, to us, that's not actually the real reason of how attraction forms. The real reason is that the masculine figure or the masculine archetype is supposed to create or generate safety for the feminine presence. So again, it goes back down to safety, right? Um, And if you don't have that safety, it doesn't matter how masculine you think you are. If you don't create that safety, you are in essence not giving the feminine what it needs, which is that safety again. Um, Again, it destroys the communication again. Um, And without that communication, you cannot resolve issues. You cannot resolve differences which if we know anything about entropy is that problems do come up. People do change. People shift their, their philosophy. People shift their desires, et cetera. And if you can't talk about those shifts, if you can't talk about the, the conflicts as you go through life, that puts you in a very hopeless state in the relationship to where, okay, we have problems which make us hopeless, but we can't even talk about the problems which make us even more hopeless. And that's the moment I think that couples usually break apart. Couples don't break apart because of the problems. Couples break apart because they have problems and they can't even talk about it. This episode is being brought to you by the Introvert Dating Success Academy. Look, if you're an introverted guy that was like me, where you had a hard time connecting with women, you couldn't figure out how to be on a date, how to be with women, and you were feeling anxious at times and not really being sure of what to say to women or getting all jumbled up whenever you came around them, well, I don't want you to have to go through that. And so because of this, I've created the Introvert Dating Success Academy. It is a 12-week program that is a one-on-one coaching program and video coaching program. It walks you A through Z on how to go to meet, greet, attract, date and land the woman of your dreams. It also teaches you how to be a more effective communicator. You'll learn how to be less anxious and more confident about yourself when you go on these dates and so much more. For 12 weeks, you'll get a phone call once a week. We'll go over anything you want to talk about as it pertains to dating and figure out a pathway for your life so that way you can best show up in your dating relationships effectively enough to be able to eventually get the girl of your dreams. If that is something that's appealing to you, then check out the program at introvertdatingsuccess.com. If you read over it and it sounds like something you'd be interested in, then you can definitely fill out the form to apply for the program and get started on the right track towards building the dating life that you rightfully deserve. That's introvertdatingsuccess.com. What are the mistakes that men make when trying to reconnect? Like we talked about, you know, trying to do action things and stuff like that. But like, let's say, for example, like, you know, his, for example, a guy wants his wife to be more affectionate. She feels like there's been trust violated. So as he's trying to get closer to her, she's not really being as affectionate, being as touchy, et cetera, et cetera. What are, what are the mistakes that men are doing in terms of trying to build that stuff back that they're not recognizing? The first thing is, um, so we talked about basically focusing on um, the surface level things, but if we try to go deeper and get more nuanced into this topic, the, the first thing is um, a lot of people, uh, they're what I call quite tethered. Right. And here's what I mean. Uh, your partner comes home 
from work, whatever it is, and she comes home in a pissy mood. When she's pissy, you get pissy. Then you get pissy, then she gets pissy back. So there's almost like this rope for a lot of for a lot of couples that holds them together. If one goes down, the other goes down. Uh, and this is what we call in our program and our with our clients is this tethering. Um, your state of mind, your state of emotions often depends on what is happening with external things, including what your partner is doing, what the world is happening, and so on. It's not sourced internally. And if you are in this tethered state, you can never be the person who can create safety because you're always going to be kind of thrown and pulled in many different directions that life pulls you in. The crux of creating safety is that, you know, so let's say your partner is expressing something difficult, a tough truth. Maybe she's having a bad day at work. Maybe she's telling you something that you did in the past that she was not very happy with. If you're tethered, you will respond badly to that. And when you respond badly to that, your partner will basically think, hey, whenever I express myself to this guy, whenever I express myself about my weakness, about my difficulties, about my my unhappiness, he gets weak. He gets unhappy. And if you were, if you were working in a company with someone like that, a leader who just gets thrown off, whatever the employees feel, mm. you can never feel safe, right? You can you don't want to tell this boss whatever it is you're thinking, what is whatever is happening, because you don't think this guy can take it. So as long as you're tethered, it's going to be very hard for you to create safety. I can see how like women would start to feel like it's more like a like more like the guy's a dictator in terms of like if if you tell them anything bad, it's like off of their head, like no, no. So it's like we're in the process of that. You then lose somebody that wants to communicate with you because you, they're not thinking they can do that. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just keep it to myself rather than tell you and create some drama that you can't even deal with because you're so tethered to to something. The other part is a very subconscious part that I haven't really talked about in any of my YouTube videos either because it's so nuanced. Um, but this is basically the the subconscious biases that we have about the way we see our life, the way we see relationships that really wreak havoc on the way we interpret something, the way we make decisions on something too. And the easiest way I can illustrate this um, is through like a simple mathematical game that I do with a lot of my clients as well. Uh, do you mind if we kind of play it for like five minutes? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm on. Yeah, okay. Okay. So the ma- the game is simple. In this game, I'm going to start by giving you three numbers. Okay. All right. So the numbers are two, four, and eight. I'm thinking of a rule, like a mathematical rule that governs the three numbers I just gave you. So like a potential rule could be even numbers, or it could be multiply by two. Those are two possible for two, four, and eight. Okay. Now, your job in this game is to guess the rule that I have in mind. But the way you do it is almost like a 20-question style where you can propose a new set of three numbers that you think fits the rule. So if you think the rule is even numbers, you could say to me, Jeff, what about 10, 12, 14? Okay. And I'll tell you whether the three numbers you gave fits my rule or not. We'll do this like three times okay. to see if you can get closer to the rule I'm thinking about. Right. And um, I'm going to write down the rule somewhere. Okay. So that we know we're not just making it up at the end. All right. So give me a set of three numbers that you think fits the rule. Okay. So the numbers two, four, and eight. Let's see. Okay. Um, different numbers. Sure. I mean, the goal again is to, for you to get closer. Like if you play 20 questions, you're not going to ask the same questions, right? Yes. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll say. 16, 8, and 2. 16, 8, and 2. That doesn't fit my rule. Okay. Uh, let's see. Whew. I'm getting back to the head of this. Okay. Um, I mean, that was when we do like, okay. So first, for this, what do you think my rule is? I'm, I'm trying to think of a bunch of them. I'm thinking of like, is it is it either addition or is it multiplying? Or like you have two times four equals eight. So then with the next number possibly be 32, <laughs> that's four times eight equals 32. And then eight times 32 is whatever that would be like, if that's possible, I'm thinking, okay, it could just be, maybe I'm making it too hard on myself. It's just like, okay, two times four is eight. And then well, two times four is eight. And then, or maybe it's double like two, and then times, times, uh, two times two is four. And then four times two is eight. And then eight times two is 16. And then six times two is 32. No, that's not my rule. Okay. Okay. Give me one more set of three numbers. Okay. Uh, let's see. We'll go. You know what? I'll just try this out. Uh, let's see. Three, six, 12. 
Three, six, twelve. That fits my rule. What do you think it is? Yes. Okay. Um, I think it's two times four is eight. And then, so I just said, okay, three times. Wait, so I, I, did, I did addition. I think I did addition. Three, <laughs> I would have said three, six, 12. So three plus three is six, and six plus six is 12. So I, I added the number. So two plus two is four, four plus four is eight. Not my rule. Okay. Uh, one more okay. try. One more try. I don't know. I thought I had it on that one, man. No, I thought I really had it on the, the, when okay. I the odd numbers. So let me just tell you what it is. Okay. Uh, number, the rule was simply numbers in increasing order. That was it. And, <laughs> and here's why I play, and here's why I play that game with you. Okay. Okay. And this is a uh, this is a very accurate representation of how a lot of our brains think and how we approach communication and relationships in general. Mm-hmm. Um, when I gave you that challenge, the first thing you did was you formed this me- metaphorical box in your head, and the box you play is basically okay. I think the answers could be this, 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 this list of ten things. And when you asked your questions you were trying to see which of the answers that I put in my box was correct. Yes. Right, you're trying to basically do process of elimination there. The problem though is that what if the answer wasn't never in your box? Wow. Then you could be asking questions all day long and thinking that you know, but you're nowhere closer to the truth. And this is often how we approach relationships. We ask questions, which gives us the illusion that we are researching. Mm-hmm. We are knowing, we are curious, but we are curious in a very un- uncurious way. We're actually nowhere closer to the truth. So if you hear a lot of your partner saying, for example, never mind, you don't get it. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Usually it's because she thinks this guy's not getting it. <laughs> this guy's not getting it and is nowhere close to getting it. Mm-hmm. So just to uh, give you a quick idea, the only way you could have found the answer was if you tried to go antithetic on me. Uh, so for example, if you tried to disprove the rule. So if... Okay. You know, in the first one, you gave the three numbers and I said, no, it doesn't fit my rule. That was actually you getting closer to the rule. Because if you kept going and you said, what about 10, 9, 8? What about 10, 7, 4? Because I said you backwards. Start to, yeah, so you start to understand like, okay, oh. anytime I say a negative number or going downwards, it's, it, it, it's wrong. Oh. So maybe it's increasing numbers. But... We noticed that, what I noticed that was interesting was that when I said to you, that fits my rule, you went, yeah, <laughs> but that actually doesn't help you get to the rule, right? And so this is kind of the way our subconscious biases, the way we've been trained to think uh, in our human brain works, kind of wreaks havoc in a lot of parts of our relationship. It's why we can't really understand our partner bit really deeply, why we can't often understand ourselves. And this is the part that, a big part of the program that we try to tap into is understanding the mechanics of these subconscious biases mm. and understanding how they wreak havoc on our relationships and really reversing that to try to think better, to try to look at the world in a very different way as well. And the reason why often I think a lot of people cannot create safety is because they cannot fix these subconscious biases because it's subconscious. They never realize they are doing these things until someone points it out to them. You know? Yeah. I think about how many men think to themselves, well, I'm doing all the right stuff. And well, she's saying that this is the problem. So I, I can do X, Y, and Z to fix it. Not even thinking that like the solution they're coming up with is actually outside of the box and is not anywhere near what's in her box for what she thinks would actually fix the solution in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, precisely. So I appreciate you being patient with me because it's so hard to tell people what they don't know. And I think that game was like the best way to just figure out <laughs> to people like what they don't know. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, I've never heard that game before, but that is definitely like something to add to the repertoire because that would definitely open up a lot of minds. <laughs> like, because I think I always tell when I, when I when I'm coaching men, I always tell them that the 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 main problem we have is like we are all the heroes in our own story. Meaning, whatever we do is the right thing. So, if our woman's coming to us with a problem, well, I know how to fix it. They're crazy. If they don't like the solution, it's because they don't want to work with me. I have all the and it's like you never think about like could I be possibly biased based on my own thoughts and how I feel about myself? Like, I don't have all the answers. Yeah. Yeah, but that's the beautiful thing. Like if you look at top leaders, even in business, they don't know all the answers and they are very quick to admit they don't know know all the answers. So if you look at top leaders, they spend most of the meeting, if it's like an hour meeting, they spend probably like 45 minutes asking really good antithetical questions, really good thought-provoking questions. Then at the last part, do they go, oh, here's a solution. But I think a lot of men skip the 45 minutes of asking and discovering 
because they think they need to know all the answers. Actually, good leaders don't. They don't do that. Very true. Also, honestly, I think too, again, since women typically best communicate through talking, I think a lot of times for men, like I know me, I'm an introvert also. I know after a while, I'm kind of like, we're on the same subject or she's, they've been talking for X amount of time. Can we just get to the point? But it's like it, in doing that, though, you don't allow them to really express and really get out every detail that you would actually need because we just we we're very quick to jump on. You've said like five words. I already know what, what how to handle this. And it's like, no, no, no. There's <laughs> other stuff to, to, she needs to say <laughs> before you really get the full solution of what's actually happening. Yeah. Yeah. We do that a lot. Um, this is what, what we call like getting lost in the trees and not seeing the forest in a way. We get stuck to like what they're saying. So, for example, they bring up something from that happened five years ago. And the first thing you think about is like, I thought we resolved that. It's like, wait, wait, wait. She's not bringing that up because she wants to bring up like an old hatchet. She's trying to tell you, she's trying to show you something. She's trying to communicate to you something, but you're not seeing it. A lot of men don't get that too. And it's, it's a fascinating thing once men understand just how easy it is for you to understand where your partner's coming from. And all you have to do is listen in a proper way. It's so simple, right? It, it, it cuts out all this like politics out of it and all this complexity out of it is beautiful. Now, what can men do at the point where they're feeling like their relationship is hopeless and there's like, there's no hope at all. Like how can a guy realistically start to really see what's really going on and start to turn that kind of stuff around? Um, I think the first thing you need to do is stop playing the victim a bit. Um, you know, our human minds, they really fall into, and they're very susceptible to what we call the fundamental attribution error. This is when, uh, whenever we see conflicts happening, whenever we see issues happening, to other people, by other people, we tend to blame their character very fast. But if we do the same things, we tend to blame circumstances, environments really fast. Um, a great example of this is like stonewalling again, right? If other people are stonewalling us, we're very quick to say, you're a bad communicator. You suck, right? This can't work out if you're like this. You got to stop doing that. We need to communicate. I mean, we instantly say, this is a character problem with you. But when, when I pinpoint to you all the times that you have stonewalled, we say, oh, it's because this partner is not really good to talk to, or, or it's because the problem is too complex and I don't really know how to express it. It's because I'm tired, right? So if someone else is doing something bad, we instantly say it's a character problem, but when we are doing the same things, we say, it's not my fault, it's something else's. That happens everywhere. Like even when you're driving, um, someone cuts you off <laughs> and you say, what, an, what a dick. But then if you are driving like that, it's because, oh, it's some circumstance. I have a good reason behind it. As long as you have that kind of thinking, that kind of bias, the fundamental attribution error bias, it's really hard for you to even recognize your role in anything, in anything in relationships. You're always going to be blaming it to something else, some other person. It's always their, their fault. And if you play victim like that, it's really hard for you to ever... You know, if you don't even recognize you have a problem, you can't fix it. I've heard so many men say, you know, well, you know, all women are crazy, yada, yada, yada. But they've been through like nine relationships and all nine of those broke up where the woman left. And I was wondering, like, at what point do you realize maybe I'm like, I know like 25, 26, I'm like, I'm, I actually have girls that like me now, but then they keep going away. Maybe I'm part of the problem. And a lot of guys don't even like think that's a, a thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a big issue. And I think um, I'm blessed to have like all, all my clients. So basically, before they can even apply for the program <laughs> and enroll as a client from my from, from mine, I think most of the men, if not all, realize that already. Um, so I get to be shielded from those very self righteous men. But <laughs> yeah, it's a big problem for sure because I get it in a lot of my YouTube comments and so on who haven't taken my program. You know. And speaking of that, because I've been to your channel, I noticed aside from by the way, Jeffrey has a lot of great videos giving advice. Uh, ju just the free advice. I mean, the, the stuff at the website is awesome. The, the, the stuff on the YouTube channel is fantastic. But he also has a lot of testimonials from guys that have gone through his program and had really, really good results. What would you say? Because obviously you teach a lot of this in your program. But like, what's like, like one thing that you teach these guys in the program that you realize, oh, this is really an eye opener for guys that they that they would actually like allow them to go back to their significant other or struggling relationship and then turn it around. The biggest part for us uh, is, is to. Well, it's, it's really hard to boil it down to a few. Let me try to my best here. It's really four different layers, I think. And sorry, sorry to make overcomplicate this, but you know, it's not just uh, the surface level stuff that really matters, right? It's like you got to have this deep internal change, and to create that deep internal change, you got to embrace complexity a bit. Um, the first layer that we have is what we call in our program the bulletproof mindset, and this is really a different way of managing your emotions, looking at the world to allow you to 
do and say the right things and say the right things and do the right things all the time, effortlessly, and out of a more genuine place. And so the crux of this is if, let's say, you look at the approach of most people into how they manage emotions. You know, if you look at the principles of emotions is that an event happens first, the event subconsciously passes through your paradigms, um, the way you've been trained to believe the world in a certain way, the way the lens you see the world, basically. This can be uh, done through how you grew up, um, the, your experiences, but we subconsciously have all these beliefs in our mind. So the event passes through the lens of our beliefs and we make an interpretation out of it, either good or bad. And the interpretation is what causes the emotion, right? And we know this principle is true because if you put a hundred people in the same room, looking at the same thing, experiencing the same thing, those hundred people are going to have drastically different emotions about that same event. It's because the event itself doesn't create the emotions, it's the way we interpret it. Mm. So if we understand that principle, that interpretations cause the emotions, we start to see how a lot of uh, approaches to emotions management start to break down. So people talk about, for example, journaling. People talk about meditation. People talk about um, breathing and creating some space between you and the problem, et cetera, the, the good little stuff. Yeah. The problem with this is that you're trying to change their emotions after the emotions has formed, which is difficult because this is like trying to tell a depressed person to try to like save themselves. You're already in a negative emotional state, which colors the way you interpret your world. And now you're supposed to like save yourself. It's too late. So a lot of men find themselves in a position where they say something wrong. They say something they regret. Then they tell, them, tell themselves, next time I'll do better. <laughs> but then the next time something bad happens again and they do the same thing. And they live in this constant cycle of regrets because the techniques and the approaches they're trying does not get to the core, which is, are you changing the way you see your world? Are you changing the way you interpret the event, the way you interpret the world? And so what we do here in the program is we try to teach people, hey, here's how you see the world differently. Get rid of your subconscious biases, right? Mm. Um, see relationships from a different paradigm. Understand what it means to actually be masculine and so on. Then we also teach people how to program these paradigms in a very effective way so that this becomes the natural way that you think. And so now, for example, right, if my clients, you know, if so my clients all come to me when they have destroyed safety big time. And when you destroy safety big time, you get a lot of resistance in a form of stonewalling, for example. Now, when you get stonewalled, a lot of men would go, oh, I, I, I get upset. But the way we've been trained to respond is, hey, if your partner stonewalls you, that is a very genuine and very good expression in itself. And one thing you can just respond to, for example, is, hey, uh, I noticed that you're shutting down. Um, I want you to know that it's okay. You know, my old self was someone who, whenever you shut down, I would get all hissy and pissy to you. And I think that actually made you shut down even more. Now I'm realizing that when you shut down, it's usually because you don't feel good talking to me. So I actually appreciate you shutting down. Now imagine if you said that to your partner, right? That is literally- 180, yeah. Well, complete 180. But it would not come naturally to you if you haven't made that internal shift. You wouldn't even think about saying that if you haven't made that internal shift and saw the world in a different way. And if you're not poised enough to say that. So that's kind of how the, the, the bulletproof mindset that we call it kind of works together with your understanding the mm -hmm. frameworks to allow you to play the frameworks a lot better as well. And yeah. we can go deeper into um, this, the third layer, which is what we call identity shifting. And this is a crucial part because the best way to, to explain this is when you were starting this podcast, all right, and, and your business. And when you announce to people that you were doing this and you quit your job before, what do people say to you? Well, you know, it's funny. I started yeah. my journey doing this uh, back in 2004 when I, I completely failed in a relationship again. <laughs> and yeah. I, I decided, you know what? I need to write a book. I, I, I decided to write a book on how not to date. Because I was like, I can't really write a book on how to date, but I can write one how not to date. I remember <laughs> I was typing up the book I was, at my, I was at mom's house at the time. My brother comes in and is like, hey, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm writing a book on dating. And he's like, you? Like, yeah, I'm writing exactly. a book on like, I'm not to date. And it's like, well, but you're horrible at dating. Like, how, who's going to believe, who's going to listen to you? I'm like, so that's then. Fast forward to like now, where now my brother will come to me and say, hey, I'm having an issue in my relationship. Can you help me out? It's like, oh, this is a complete difference from when I started out. Like, Exactly, exactly. And that's 
uh, the experience for a lot of my clients as well is that, you know, in anything in life, right? You, you ask anyone in life, they want a different life. They want a different future. They want a life where they have better relationships, better sex, happier, richer, whatever it is. They want a different life. But what a lot of people don't realize is that to get the different life, you have to become someone different. You have to talk differently. You have to think different. You have to believe in different things. You have to maybe dress different. I don't know. You have to become a different person inside and out. But the problem is that when you try to become someone different, right? When I was starting my business, for example, I, I was a data scientist before and I was trying to be a, a relationship coach. Everyone was like, that's not you, mm -hmm. right? So as soon as you try to become someone different like that, to get to your next level, you get resistance externally. People question you, people doubt you mm. in the context of relationships, right? This is when you find me, for example, and you start to change the way you talk. Your partner will say, why do you sound like that? Why are you talking like that? You, just, why do you sound like a therapist? So instantly you get external doubt. If we haven't shifted our identity, the way we define ourselves, that external doubt quickly becomes internal doubt. And it can be very subconscious to where we start to question ourselves, we start to have a lot of doubt, we start to get depressed, we start to get demotivated, and we kind of slow down. And I'm sure when you were trying to start your business, you wanted to slow down quite a lot. Is this me? Should I, mm. should I be doing this? Right? You had a lot of doubt. Yep. Um, and when a lot of partners, right, when this doubt becomes so strong, they start to either give up or slow down the changes. And when you slow down the changes, so imagine this, you've been promising to your partner for three months, I'm going to change. These changes are real. And your partner has been resisting that the whole time, suspicious of that the whole time. And eventually, three months later, you, you just give up. It's like, well, I knew it. <laughs> it's not real. The changes aren't real. Right? So... The other part to this is you have to learn how to shift your identity because the way we've been questioning the world as humans, I think, is we tend to ask the question, who am I? Right? We like to define ourselves. So we go to a clothing store and we say, that's not me, that's me. We go look at some friends and we say, that's me, that's not me. So we always try to define who we are. But the problem is that when we define who we are, we're locked into who we are and we cannot become anymore. So when we try to become this identity to who we are kind of holds us back. It always pulls us back. And it comes in the form of doubts. It comes in the form of questioning yourself. It comes in the form of people feeling unnatural, doing different things. And when you do that, that's a big problem. You can't really change because that's like this chain holding you down in a way. And so the other thing that we help people too is to cut the chains from the old self, learn what it means to become like more like water, who can really evolve to whoever you want to be to accomplish what you want. You know, that's a massive part as well. And the last part, of course, is building self-esteem as well. It's, um, you know, a lot of toxic behaviors, insecurities is really due to the lack of self-esteem. And we work really deep with people to understanding what self-esteem is and how to build that in a very predictable way as well. Nice. I also find too, like, I think, I know, especially with a lot of the, the toxic sides of, of dating advice out there, that there can be a fear of if I open up if I allow my partner to really get to know me if I if I if I let my guard down and let my emotional safety down to let this person in that could be seen as less than masculine and she could want to leave me because I'm not being stoic or I'm not doing whatever and that only creates less trust also yeah and I think the the misnomer that a lot of people have to and again this is when we got to the conversation of the answers are never in the extremes it's always in the middle ground so we can talk about emotions on this one, for example. So most people, they see emotions that are, as in two poles. One is you are totally lost in your emotions, you're vulnerable, all these things. The other side is you're totally stoic. Either side is actually not too good, right? So of course, when you're totally carried away by emotions, it's, that's not very attractive. And it's, no. you can't function in life like that. But being stoic is also very unattractive, right? Imagine your partner comes home to you crying about something, <laughs> And you are just completely stoic. It's like, it's, it's not a very fun conversation to be in. Um, the, the thing we preach is like something in the middle of this is what we call controlled compassion. It's when you're in control of your emotions enough because you understand how to interpret the world, but you are still compassionate in a sense that you are able to show the appropriate emotion for that particular time. All right. So if a, your girlfriend comes home crying to you, you're not completely stoic, but you're getting down to her level in a way to really make her feel deeply understood, to really make her feel deeply heard with the right tone, with the right emotions, with the right vibe and aura for that particular conversation. 
And that's the middle ground that a lot of people, I think, have a hard time embracing, um, especially with now a lot of people talking about be more masculine, be more masculine, be more masculine, be more stoic, be more stoic. And stoicism is such a big topic right now. And I don't really agree fully with either extremes. I think anything in life, you got to embrace the middle. Yeah. And I think some of that too, like, I think some of those things are examples of things where we'll say leaning towards an extreme can work necessarily per se in the attraction phase of like, you know, like a woman doesn't want to meet you on the first date and you're crying your eyes out or whatever. But like in a relationship, that's bound to happen. People are going to, you know, pass away, hard things are going to happen. And for you to still be in that same frame of mind, like that doesn't always work when you're doing something long-term because they want to know that you feel stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The last question I have is for, so there will be men listening to this that let's say they're not in relationships yet and, but they're, they're wanting to get towards one. They know at some point if they date somebody that it gets to a relationship and it's going to be coming. How can they, in advance of those kind of things, how can they know, how can they create an environment of emotional safety for any upcoming relationship that they have? Again, it's not like a one answer kind of deal. It's a, it's a full package, but I think the best um, example that I can give is understanding the principle behind persuasion. Um, so here, when you're in a relationship, whether you're in a marriage or you're starting to date someone, right? The number one thing I think you need to do is to persuade that person to feel safe with you. And I know a lot of people here probably, you know, in the dating stages are probably saying like, well, why is safety the number one thing? Again, safety is what is why the masculine figure is so important. The masculine figure is there to create a safety. If you can create that emotional safety, that's how you build a connection. That's how you make someone, a woman feel comfortable around you, right? Uh, it, it doesn't ruin intrigue or anything like that. This is just human connection in general. And if we want to persuade safety and trust, we have to understand that the essence of persuasion is not about what you say. So a lot of people, when they're dating, when they're in the relationships, they tend to focus too much on being interesting. And like, they are like this awesome macho winner figure, <laughs> but persuasion doesn't happen when you say something, right? Persuasion happens when you, f you feel understood by the person that's persuading you. So for example, if you go to a mechanic and because something's wrong with your car and you go to two mechanics, one mechanic was able to describe to you exactly what's going on with your car. He tells you, I've driven your car before. He even points out problems with your car that you can't even, you, you didn't even realize. But you know, like once he mentions it, you're like, yeah, you're right. That is a problem. Instantly, without him telling you what he's going to do to fix it, without him telling you about his awards, about how big his business is, whatever it is, instantly you trust that guy. Because it's not about what you say, it's about how you make the other person feel understood. And so, when it comes to dating or relationships, don't be interesting. Don't try so hard to be interesting, saying the perfect things. Learn how to become interested and learn how to understand someone on a very deep level to where you can either describe their sensations, their feelings deeper than they can themselves. If you can do that, any date you go to, you're going to be such a great date. Any relationship you go to, you're going to be such a great partner to be around if you can develop that skill. That's so true. And it's interesting. I have a friend of ours, a uh, female friend from way back in the day, they used to tell us that she actually appreciated, like, it's kind of like she knew how the dance of dating and relationships worked. And she was actually happy to know, like, she could tell when a guy knew what he was doing. Like, oh, he knew how to, you know, talk to me and how to get the street, this and that. And at the time I was like, but isn't that game playing? Like, you, he, you know, he's running game on you. But it was like, no, I know how, that he knows how to treat me in the way I want to be treated. So that makes me feel more, a better connection. It's like, oh, well, I got money and oh, I know how to do this and I'm going to treat you right, babe. I swear. It's like <laughs> just doing the actions of that and letting her feel that it's, it's persuading her without even having to say it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Please let people know where they can find your, your, more of your stuff, your channels, your websites, all that good stuff. You can find me on YouTube, of course. Uh, my name is a bit complicated. It's Jeffrey Satiawan. <laughs> But I'm sure you will have my name, my full name somewhere in the, on the page. So you can find me there. Um, just Google my name, uh, you search it on YouTube, and you can find my channel. Um, I also have a masterclass. So if you check out um, any of my videos and you check out the description or even in the end um, screen of my videos, you can see a link to the masterclass. And in this masterclass, basically, we go really deep into telling you about the different factors and the different uh, parts of the system 
of what you need to understand, what you need to master so that you can create this very complete and holistic and thriving relationship, both not only uh, in the external side and the relationship itself, but also where you can feel at home, where your partner can feel at home and feel like you are thriving together in the relationship as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, guys. I hope you learned a lot. So definitely check out his webpage, check out his YouTube channel. Like I said, he's got a lot of great videos there, a lot of great links that you can learn all about the ins and outs of uh, being in a relationship and learning the ins and outs of how to heal your relationships, how to better connect with your partner, all this stuff you can find at his website. You can also go to my website, introvertdatingsuccess.com for eBooks, audiobooks, programs, and my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Harry Wilmington. If you found the info in this episode to be helpful, please show your support by clicking on the tip jar tab, the link of which can be found at the website and in the description below. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment on this episode and catch new episodes right here on YouTube or wherever podcasts can be found. In the meantime, be sure to check out these other episodes so you too can learn to date as your introverted self while still getting your precious alone time. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.